Hey, welcome back everybody. Hopefully we're having a wonderful start to the weekend out there and obviously all eyes are on the Gulf of Mexico where we could potentially have a hurricane forming within the next week and we could see a landfall as early as next weekend. So uh, again, we've been talking about this basically all week. We are going to have to continue to talk about it for the next week ahead because again, uh, a lot of concern with this and a lot of the trends overnight in the models uh, have continued to kind of uptick the chances of this storm forming. So obviously, we're going to break all that down for you in today's video. Now, outside of there, there are other areas in the Atlantic we are watching for potential development as well as a storm system currently crossing the lower 48 that's going to bring some severe weather and some much needed rainfall to some folks uh, who I know could definitely use it. So uh, if you're new to the channel, welcome. My name is Gerald. I'm a meteorology major at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte in my junior year. So a little more than halfway done here uh, and uh, here to give you the latest information again on what we're seeing with the models and kind of an analysis and breakdown of what that means for you uh, and how you can plan for that forecast ahead. Uh, now, if you haven't already subscribed, please do so. And I want to say thank you, by the way. The videos this week have been doing very well. We've gained a lot of new subscribers. We've had a lot more views than uh, an average week, which you would expect with more active weather. But still, uh, I want to thank all of you for returning uh, and coming back to watch. And again, if you're new, uh, welcome. It's great to have you. So again, hit that subscribe button, like the video, hit the bell for latest notifications, comment, let me know what you're seeing out there, uh, especially if you live in and along. Uh, the Gulf Coast of the United States or even outside of the United States. I know I have some viewers uh, from other areas of the Caribbean uh, and Atlantic. So again, love to hear from you folks as well. Also consider sharing the video with somebody that you think might find it interesting uh, or if they live in that potential impact zone. With that said, let's dive on into things and start talking about some weather. So taking a look at satellite imagery currently, things are relatively quiet, although um, you can kind of see the beginning of some trouble spots. Now, obviously the big area, a lot of people are watching is right down here into the Gulf of Mexico uh, and into the Western Caribbean. And we are beginning to see some shower and storm activity in that area. And I'll mention you're beginning to see it along both sides of Central America, the Pacific side and uh, the Atlantic side. This is a classic example of a Central American gyre. Uh, you'll also hear the term CAG. Basically, it's just an individualized cell in the atmosphere. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and what I mean by that is it's just kind of an area of distinct rising and sinking motion that oftentimes can create areas of stronger uh, convection. It's the same kind of thing that we have with the intertropical convergence zone that creates storms out in the main uh, development region of the Atlantic. We see the same thing here uh, in and around Central America. Uh, so again, the science behind it isn't that big of a deal, but just know it's a favorable area for tropical development and that favorable area, climatologically speaking, could lead to tropical development uh, into the coming week. Now, outside of there, we are watching a couple other areas of some storm activity out here into the Atlantic. I'll even just you know, circle kind of all of the big trouble spots here. All of those, uh, at least the ones that I will say have a chance of forming, which is really these two is what the NHC is watching, uh, could form, but the chances are very low and impacts would be none. Uh, again, these are going to stay out into the main development region of the Atlantic. However, I will mention uh, we will have a wave coming off of Africa here uh, that could develop into a storm within the next seven to 10 days as well. And you can see that here on our latest National Hurricane Center map. Uh, so again, obviously the big you know storyline is the area in the Gulf up to a 60% chance of development, likely going to get higher than that here. We'll likely see this change to a red shade, meaning it's likely to develop uh, right now still in that medium chance of development, but again, uh, uptrending. So very likely to be a high level of development. Uh, or high chance of development here pretty soon. These other two areas, again, 10% each, low chance of development. Uh, and then the area to the south, this is newly designated. Uh, this has a 30% chance now of developing within the next seven days. And again, uh, that's that wave that's coming off of Africa right now uh, that will eventually get into this region. And obviously, you know, that's a part of the world that we want to watch during hurricane season for development. And we'll touch on that here uh, in this video. <clears throat> All right, so we're gonna go ahead and break things down here for you and kind of talk about some model guidance and what it means, what the trends have been, uh, and kind of what my personal thought process is here. So uh, I'll go ahead and just tell you from last night, the models have come into more agreement, not complete agreement by any means, but better, I think, than we were this time yesterday, uh, which is good, but the not so good news is they've come into more agreement on the likelihood that we will have a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico that is likely to uh, make landfall somewhere in the United States. So, uh, you know, not what you wanna see, but uh, it is at 
least nice that we're going to have a good heads up on this one. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're going to have plenty of time to forecast it and give you the latest information. So with that said, let's dive into some model guidance. And we're going to start with the GFS. And I think personally, the GFS has done the best with this storm. It stayed very consistent. And uh, my bet is it's probably going to win out when all is said and done. So here we go. We go into really not far from now this coming week during the middle of the week. This is Wednesday morning. You'll notice uh, low pressure beginning to form here in and around the Yucatan Peninsula. And we get a tropical storm to form really as early as Wednesday afternoon and evening and it's eventually into the Gulf of Mexico by Thursday morning as a 993 millibar low. And I know um, the millibar numbers are hard to read here, so I'll try to verbalize it for you. Uh, but again, a 993 millibar low in the central Gulf of Mexico this coming Thursday morning. So again, only five or six days from now. Uh, or really more like five days, I guess, uh, and beginning and continuing to strengthen. So it does that, it continues, it gets down to 974 millibars, uh, and then eventually 972 millibars, which again would be a borderline major hurricane, and landfalls right into the Big Bend of Florida. And uh, let me tell you, Big Bend of Florida feels like cannot catch a break from these hurricanes the past couple of years. Uh, it just seems like storm after storm. Uh, again, this is the same area Debbie made landfall earlier this year, and then similar to Debbie, uh, the GFS hooks this up through the Florida Panhandle, gets it back off the Carolina coast, and then rides up the Carolina coast as a tropical storm or uh, low end hurricane, and then eventually gets on out of here and moves out to sea. So again, things moving quick here on the GFS. This is you know a lot quicker than some of the models yesterday showed. So we have landfalling system within a week. This is overnight Friday uh, into next week in a landfalling hurricane. And again, bringing those hurricane impacts into the Panhandle of Florida, and then potentially even up the coast into the Carolinas. So that's a GFS. Let's take a look at the European model. Similar in the sense it does form a system. However, I want you to note a difference here. Again, I talked about uh, the Central American gyre can form storms in the Atlantic or the Pacific, and the European forms a storm, but it first storms, uh, excuse me, <laughs> first forms it uh, into the Pacific and then actually kind of tugs its energy back over Mexico here uh, and then gets it into the Gulf. So because of that, uh, it's a longer process to develop the storm, and we don't really get a true center of circulation uh, until Thursday afternoon and Thursday evening, so a full day or two behind the GFS. And again, uh, how the system forms differently is going to mess with uh, the exact track it takes and the timing it takes as well. Uh, so again, this is Friday morning, Friday afternoon, and Friday evening. At this point, the GFS was making landfall into Florida. The European has this massive area of just broad low pressure, uh, which again would be a tropical storm, but it's a lot messier here. And uh, if I switch this to our MSLP map uh, or just our surface pressure map, uh, you'll notice here uh, yeah, take a look at how big this area is. Uh, and then it does deepen it and uh, it does get it into, uh, you know, tropical storm to hurricane status and then makes landfall into the Florida Panhandle. But this would be next Sunday afternoon. So again, uh, takes a bit of a different track to get there. It's a little bit longer, uh, but still brings a landfalling system into Florida. Now, what I want you to know, and another reason I switched to this map, uh, is look at how large this area of blue is. I mean, if I uh, go to just how big all of the actual closed ice bars here. I mean, this is technically the size of uh, the low pressure for the storm. Now, obviously, it gets uh, deeper as you go further in, um, but still, you know, you get the point. This is a big area uh, of low pressure. And one kind of caveat that comes with forecasting a system that is large uh, is it comes with different effects. Now, small hurricanes uh, generally are stronger and they're usually, it's easier for them to undergo rapid intensification, um, which is obviously the con to small hurricanes. The pro to a small hurricane is it's smaller. Less people feel the effects of it. Um, the area of the worst weather is smaller. It's kind of the opposite with these large systems. Um, so, with a large storm, you're gonna probably bring the wind field, uh, or excuse me, you're gonna bring the max winds down a little bit, just meaning the storm's not gonna get probably quite as strong as it would if it was tighter and more compact. Uh, but the downside of that is you spread the wind out because uh, again, this area of low pressure is having to uh, you know, kind of spread out that wind field across a much larger area. And with that, more people feel the effects. Also, storm surge is generally worse with a large storm. Again, uh, imagine with a small storm, you're gonna have little wind vectors like this that are very strong, uh, but you know, relatively small and compact. With a big storm like this, you're gonna have these much larger streamlines uh, that kind of, you know, 
uh, bring the winds again just off or you know through bigger areas. So storm surge is generally higher. It generally impacts more people. Uh, the rain impacts more people. Uh, potential severe weather threat would impact more people. And then again, much like the GFS, this moves up into the southeast uh, within the seven to ten day range. So uh, those are the two main models. Those are the big ones that we often use. But let's take a look at some other models as well, uh, just to kind of get a grasp for what we're looking at here. And um, we'll start here with the Canadian model or the CMC. Uh, you'll hear the GEM model again plenty of names for it, but uh, we move this ahead into time. It develops a tropical system really in the Caribbean uh, before this ever even gets into the Gulf, and we have a name system probably by Tuesday afternoon on the Canadian, uh, which is, again, you know, not far from now. It's like four days, so, uh, you know, we're getting close to potential development of this system, moves over the Yucatan, gets into the Gulf of Mexico, and then strengthens much like the other storms uh, or much like the other models did, uh, but is much further to the west, brings a landfall over Louisiana, Indiana instead of the Florida Panhandle. So, uh, you know, it's a different solution for sure, but uh, overall speaking, we're closer um, to, I think, getting the right idea than we were yesterday. And timing on that, again, I should mention, uh, would be a Friday afternoon landfall in Louisiana on that storm uh, and then uh, brings it inland and then kind of, you know, meanders and dies out over the Mid South. All right, show you another model here. The Icon model did uh, pretty well with um, Francine, actually, the Icon. So uh, it's one we'll watch, and unfortunately, it's one that we don't really want to happen. Uh, again, forms a system, kind of shoots the gap between the Yucatan and Cuba uh, by Wednesday afternoon, gets this into the Gulf of Mexico, slows it down significantly, uh, and deepens it very much so uh, into a major hurricane. Uh, and I don't think uh, we have, we don't have the uh, surface pressure map on this uh, model, but uh, again, Again, a very large storm here in the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, really taking up kind of the entire Gulf here uh, as a major hurricane that is deepening um, pretty uh, extensively here and then moving northwards towards the Gulf Coast. Now, this is as far out as this model goes, so I can't show you, you know, where exactly it makes landfall. But again, the important thing is it shows the same idea of a tropical system forming. Final model I'll show you, the European AI model. This is a new one, kind of the new kid on the block, if you will. Uh, and uh, it agrees with the other models, forms a tropical system near the Yucatan Peninsula by Tuesday into Wednesday afternoon, uh, and then gets it into the Gulf of Mexico, deepens it down into a 972 millibar low, and much like the icon I just showed you, moves it into Louisiana as a strong hurricane Friday afternoon, almost identical, um, or I guess it was the Canadian I showed you, sorry, not the icon, uh, but almost identical to the Canadian model, and then uh, moves it up the Mississippi River Valley. So uh, different solutions between the models obviously and you know that's going to be something we watch but I'm going to show you the ensembles in a minute and I think you'll begin to realize um, we still have a better idea of what's going to happen today than we did yesterday so uh, we're going to take baby steps here again we're still probably a week from impacts uh, or a landfall at the earliest six days I'd say at the earliest um, so you know we've got time to figure things out so do not you know panic yet do not uh, freak out by any means. All right, let's take a look at some ingredients for this tropical system to develop. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, we need a storm to have impacts at all. So let's see what are the odds the storm actually forms. Well, obviously, all the models are forming it, which tells us the ingredients have to be at least somewhat favorable for a tropical system. Uh, and one of those ingredients is sea surface temperatures. Uh, so for tropical development, generally you want at least 26 degrees Celsius sea surface uh, temperature, which is those yellow colors and up. So again, you look at the scale on the right-hand side, I know the colors are kind of um, shifted or uh, let me that, the numbers are kind of cut off a little bit, but yellow uh, and up on that scale. So the yellow, oranges, reds, and the pinks, those are favorable. But once you get into these reddish colors and especially these pink colors, these are favorable enough to promote uh, extensive rapid, uh, or excuse me, extensive in, uh, intensification sorry uh, and you know it's more than enough to really support one of these big storms in the Gulf and we have that we have sea surface temperatures near 31 almost 32 degrees Celsius uh, and I mean that's that's as high as the chart goes so these are some of the warmest sea surface temperatures in the Atlantic Ocean or probably I'll just go ahead and say in the Atlantic Ocean in general uh, anywhere whether it's the North Atlantic or the South Atlantic again some of the warmest ocean temperatures uh, for a storm to potentially use and this is exactly where the storm is going to go into this region now, a couple other things you need for a storm uh, is you need plenty of moist air uh, and you need low wind shear values. Well, let's start with the moisture content. 
uh, and the greenish bluish areas on this map, uh, those are more favorable for development, higher humidity values, higher, you know, uh, ability to grow thunderstorms, the more brownish colors are less likely to promote tropical development as that's more dry air and kind of just messes with these storms. Now, at the beginning of the storm's life, there is plenty of moisture in and around that is not going to be a problem. Now, what could happen towards the end is we see some dry air work in. So this is the GFS model. This gets us into Thursday. Uh, so now through next Thursday, you know, it looks favorable. There's plenty of moisture for the storm to work with. Uh, but what kind of happens here is there's a trough up here that begins to pick up that storm. And on the back side of that trough, we're seeing a lot of dry air being advected downward towards the Gulf of Mexico. So uh, this could end up being kind of a hybrid cane of sorts as it makes landfall. We've seen a lot of these storms this year. Uh, Debbie, for example, is a lot like this where you know, it was very lopsided. One side wasn't a whole lot, and the other side, uh, there was a ton of rain and wind. Uh, this storm could be similar, uh, although what's going to matter a lot is how tight does that core get before this dry air catches up to it. Uh, if it can really isolate itself, this dry air might not do a lot to weaken the storm. If this is kind of a strung out mess by the time the dry air gets there, uh, then that could really help us out a lot. So uh, that's something we're going to want to watch for sure. That's uh, something uh, that could be a detriment to the storm, which would be a good thing at least towards the end of its life cycle. Again, now through kind of Wednesday or Thursday, I think the storm's going to have all the time in the world to slowly get its act together uh, and begin to strengthen. But upon final approach to the United States, could see some of that uh, dry air help us out. All right, what about uh, wind shear? Uh, that's another ingredient uh, for hurricanes or specifically an ingredient you don't want to see if you're a hurricane. Uh, so, you know, higher wind shear values can kind of tear apart these storms. Hurricanes are these big, massive storms. Uh, and you think, you know, they're kind of made, uh, you know, built tough. Uh, but uh, funnily enough, they're very fragile beings. So uh, with just a little bit of wind shear, you can really tear them apart. Unfortunately, Again, at the beginning of the storm's life cycle, uh, there's very favorable, you know, levels of wind shear, meaning there's not a lot, and the little bit that there is um, is actually going to help the storm out here with some divergence aloft. This is the upper levels, uh, so the upper level winds, you know, well above our heads, even kind of higher than planes fly here, or about where planes fly, uh, a little higher than planes fly. Anyway, <laughs> uh, what's happening here, though, is the wind is spreading out. So what happens is that creates a void in the atmosphere, kind of a column here. Uh, you're spreading out the top of it. So what has to happen at the bottom is it has to make up for that. So the wind hits each other at the bottom and converges and goes upward again to kind of fill that void. Uh, and that is, you know, divergence aloft or convergence at the surface, and that creates low pressure and can oftentimes lead to storm systems. Um, and this is unfortunately kind of what's happening here. And it's going to really help the storm strengthen uh, and it could stay that way again until I think probably upon final approach to the United States, maybe a little bit of weakening. Uh, that same trough that's going to add some dry air is probably going to add some wind shear here. You'll notice uh, some higher levels uh, of wind here in the Gulf of Mexico blowing towards the storm. That's also going to help to make it kind of lopsided here towards the right hand side. So uh, it's something to watch here. I think obviously if it's a storm that you know goes up to Louisiana, the ingredients are going to be different. The steering currents are going to be different. But overall, um, I do think there will be some you know dry air and wind shear towards the end of the storm upon final approach to the United States uh, that could help us out a little bit here uh, in keeping this from being a super big time. Uh, you know, major like category five hurricane. But again, this is going to be a large storm. So oftentimes these large storms are felt differently, even if the category value isn't as high as a smaller storm. All right. So let's take a look at kind of spaghetti models in a way, if you will. These are technically ensembles. So these are the European ensembles, basically just a bunch of individualized runs of the European model. Also, wow, I just realized we've been going 18 minutes. Um, I feel like this has been five minutes. But uh, anyway, these are a bunch of individualized runs of the European model that kind of use different starting points in the atmosphere, different metrics to get a different final result. Uh, and we'll take a look at this here and you'll notice if you watched yesterday's video, we've got a lot more confidence than we did yesterday. Yesterday, we had a ton of these members that just stalled this out down here in the Bay of Campeche. Today, uh, a lot more models are kind of moving towards the GFS side of things and pulling this north. Now, uh, again, we're seeing differences. We're seeing a cluster anywhere from the Big Bend to Florida, you know, back towards New Orleans. So uh, still a big area of some sway here, but much more in agreement with each other. And a lot of these models, I'll mention again, get this into hurricane status over the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and, you know, some of them even get this into a major hurricane down into the 950s and the 940 millibar range. 
so, you know, a, a lot of possibilities still here on the table, but more in line than I think we were yesterday. And if we take a look at the GFS and its ensemble members, I know it's an absolute mess and you probably wonder why I just drew a bunch of squiggly lines on the map. Um, but um, still, it brings home the point, a storm in the Gulf of Mexico, but anybody, again, from Florida to uh, probably, we'll say Texas, but I think especially Louisiana, Louisiana to Florida needs to be, you know, keeping an eye on this as the models continue to come together here uh, on exact timing and impacts. All right. Um, final thing I'll talk about with this system, then we're going to kind of breeze through the rest of the video here a little bit, is just steering and, you know, why are we seeing differences in the models? Uh, well, it all has to do with kind of a storm system we're seeing right now over the lower 48 uh, and one that we're going to see. So basically, we're expecting a trough to dip down into the Ohio River Valley by the middle of this coming week. Uh, and by the time this is doing it, again, here's our trough. You see this little pocket of blue. Uh, here's our storm in the Gulf and how these two interact will really determine um, you know, what happens here? The GFS model kind of, uh, you know, converges the two pretty quickly and pulls the storm north again through Florida and then eventually through the Carolinas. Um, and I think that's a pretty, you know, a scenario that could be pretty likely here. Again, you see them kind of converge together, pulls the storm north, uh, and then almost forms a bigger storm over the northeast in the long run. Uh, but again, we'll get there when we get there. Uh, the European model, a little bit different here. It kind of cuts off that trough, the, uh, and, you know, stalls it out over portions of Texas and Oklahoma next week. Uh, so that's kind of why at the beginning of the storm's life cycle on the European, uh, it almost gets pulled towards Louisiana a little bit, but then curves back towards Florida. As I move this ahead, you'll see why. Uh, again, what happens is that trough finally, you know, kind of gets, you know, pulled uh, back towards the southeast. The ridge relaxes a little bit, uh, and then the storm works over the southeastern United States. So uh, different steering currents basically is kind of the point of that uh, and kind of the point I was trying to drive home there. Uh, and uh, just knowing that that is why we're still seeing some troubles with the models getting an exact answer on what's going to happen. All right, also in the tropics on down the road, again, going to not talk too long about this because this is going to be a 30-minute long video, um, but uh, we do have other areas to watch out into the Atlantic that do have the potential to develop here. You'll notice in uh, the long run, uh, this is about a week or so from now, multiple other storms showing up out here uh, in the main development region of the Atlantic. Well too soon to know if that's going to lead to anything uh, of significance, but uh, knowing nonetheless that uh, it is something we need to watch here. And if we take a look at the ensembles, uh, sure enough, you'll note a big time signal here for some sort of storm to try to get going. And some of these in the 10 day range get it uh, a little bit close down here to the Antilles. So we'll watch it for sure. I'll keep you up to date. Uh, but again, the Gulf Storm is still kind of the main, um, you know, concern right now on the map. All right, it only took us 22 minutes to talk about the tropics. Not too bad, right? <laughs> Let's uh, switch gears a little bit here and talk about what's happening through the lower 48. Uh, and again, uh, the main thing I'm going to be talking about is one kind of two storm system. So currently out there, we do have a storm working over the four corners, and this will be a big time storyline for uh, some active weather through this week. Another low pressure system currently spinning up through uh, the Dakotas here, bringing some uh, pretty feisty storms actually to Minnesota this morning and afternoon. Uh, and outside of that, we've kind of got a ridge parked over portions of the uh, south uh, or just the mid-south of the United States, bringing kind of this plume of uh, some water vapor and some warmer temperatures, making it feel a little bit more like summer. Um, excuse me, than it has uh, over the last little bit. Now, radar currently, again, it's pretty active actually compared to the past couple of days. And I talked about this. I said, you know, we've got this big ridge of high pressure here. This is kind of going to work in tandem, again, bringing some moisture out of the Pacific actually. Uh, and, you know, around it, that's bringing some shower and storm activity for a lot of folks. That combined with this low pressure over the uh, four corners is going to also amplify some precipitation. And then again, that storm up into the Dakotas also amplifying precipitation. At the same time, and I forgot to mention it, we still have this pesky coastal low uh, off the coast of the Northeast bringing some active weather. Uh, so just all around different little areas that are kind of making our weather a little bit more disturbed for much of the country. Also, I just realized you probably couldn't see a lot of that. Uh, let me back out a little bit, sorry. Um, again, this is what radar looks like, so sorry about that. I forgot to change uh, the picture mode uh, for what you're seeing. All right, thank you everyone got a look at that, awesome. All right, now, watches, warnings, advisories, things still remain relatively quiet. We do have some winter weather advisories through the Rockies here just outside of Denver. We've got some flood watches up for the Texas Panhandle and into northeastern New Mexico. Uh, also, again, a couple strong storms we had this morning up into Minnesota, some severe thunderstorm warnings that way. Uh, we've had uh, some... 
um, flooding concerns up into the northeast. Again, coastal flood warnings all due to this big time, uh, you know, just trough of low pressure continuing to sit off the east coast of the United States, bringing some rip current uh, concerns uh, and a little bit of coastal flooding. Also, kind of due to the king tides, I will mention as well there, uh, which by the way, I don't know if you saw the moon last night, but pretty impressive uh, looking moon, at least here in Charlotte, it was very orange. So uh, again, I'm derailing here and not talking about things that matter, but uh, either way, uh, moving out from there, we do have some frost advisories uh, due to some cold air out west into the higher terrains there. Uh, so, you know, monitoring that as well. All right, uh, let's talk about the storm system a little bit, and then I will let you go, I promise. Um, so basically, um, sorry, I'm trying to remember what I was going to talk about here. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, okay, sorry. It, uh, it, the caffeine really is not kicked in this morning, which I know I say every morning, but uh, ultimately what ends up happening is I take one sip of coffee and pretend like that's enough to uh, get through an entire video. But uh, So we're watching the storm system that's currently over the Rockies here. Uh, and again, this is going to bring some active weather for a lot of folks, I think, through the Ohio River Valley. Uh, and, uh, you know, so much needed rainfall as well. I've got plenty of comments from some of these states in here that have been talking about how dry it's been. Well, I think this is going to fix it. We move that ahead into time. Uh, you'll notice that kind of moves again across Kansas uh, and then into Missouri, Illinois, Indiana. And another storm kind of moves down out of Canada and combines with it here uh, by the middle of this coming week. Uh, and again, we've got at this point a pretty impressive trough of low pressure parked over the eastern United States. Uh, and this is, again, what would pull up future Helene into the country. So uh, the, the models are differing here. Again, I already showed you that in the steering currents. But again, I do think we'll get a storm system of some sort that crosses the country here. Uh, and that will bring some impactful weather, including severe weather, as early as today. So again, a couple areas of severe weather, one up into the Midwest through Iowa, uh, portions of Wisconsin, uh, and into portions of Minnesota, back down towards the Kansas City area. Uh, and then back out towards portions of uh, the Mid-Atlantic going to see the potential for some strong to severe storms. Also, I mentioned this in yesterday's video down here through portions of New Mexico, West Texas, uh, an area that you know sees severe weather sometimes, but not very often here, uh, having the potential for some strong to severe storms this afternoon, including a tornado threat in that yellow area, uh, actually a bit of a tornado driven risk. So, uh, you know, could have some desert tornadoes this afternoon for sure. Definitely uh, something to keep an eye on with that storm system. Again, currently working over the four corners. That will be all of it today. Uh, by the time we get into tomorrow, another area of potential severe weather uh, from, uh, again, Missouri back down through Tulsa, Oklahoma City, and through much of Texas. We'll do it all again on Monday with a small sliver here through the Ohio River Valley, through much of Kentucky, uh, northwestern Tennessee there, down through uh, Paducah, Cape Girardeau, Louisville, uh, and uh, surrounding areas there, even the southern tip there of Illinois and Indiana could see some strong storms uh, for our Monday as the system crosses the country. All right, let's see how far ahead our map has loaded. Uh, all right, so we'll move this head into time, and uh, this is the latest model we just ran, actually, so we're still running in the, at this moment. Uh, so here comes our storm system. Again, this afternoon, uh, widespread showers and storms over the four corners, and also some severe weather, again, to the south of there through portions of uh, New Mexico and West Texas could see some strong storms to the north of there. There's a good old-fashioned rain here through a good portion of Kansas, I think, this afternoon and evening. Uh, we get this through the overnight. Uh, that rain continues, uh, severe weather threat continues in that area that I talked about, and some mountain snow begins to fall there into the Rockies of Colorado. Now we move this further ahead in time, we get this into Sunday afternoon. Again, another area of potential severe weather tomorrow, uh, down here through uh, the Oklahoma City area, back down towards Central Texas, up through Tulsa. Again, could see enough wind energy and instability for our Sunday afternoon. Uh, that we could see some strong storms in that vicinity as well. So uh, again, pretty good storm system here. We're working across the country. Uh, we'll take a look at the east here uh, and see what it looks like this way over the next day or two. Uh, this afternoon, again, uh, it's pretty rainy in the northeast for many folks. Also, a pretty good cluster of storms working through the northern mid-Atlantic we talked about uh, with that severe weather threat. Strong straight line winds would be the main threat there. Uh, so again, needing to watch that as that crosses through portions of Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Northern Virginia. Uh, as we get through this evening, um, you know, showers continue through the coastal areas of Massachusetts, uh, Rhode Island, uh, down through the Hamptons of Long Island. By the way, I had a 
comment about that. Thank you for reminding me of that area. It was Montauk specifically I was thinking of at the moment, but the Hamptons is also kind of what they call uh, that entire section of Long Island. So uh, thank you for that comment. Uh, I forget exactly who left it, but thank you. Uh, so we get into Sunday afternoon here. Again, that big storm out west continuing to work across the country, and we see a big area of moisture and rainfall. Uh, again, we get to see some good rain through Illinois, Indiana, back through Missouri, even north of there through the Chicago area. Uh, Wisconsin, Michigan could get some pretty good rain out of this for our Sunday afternoon. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll watch it for sure uh, as that kind of swings on through. I'll mention Sunday afternoon, don't rule out some severe weather uh, into this region right into here. Again, we talked about Texas and Oklahoma. This could stretch back up towards the Kansas City area uh, and the Springfield area of Illinois as well. I wouldn't rule that out for Sunday afternoon. Uh, definitely want to keep an eye on that for sure. And then uh, we uh, move it further ahead into the evening of Sunday. And again, that whole storm system generally just continues to work across the country. All right, what is this going to look like in the long run? Again, going to kind of breeze on through this. But again, the storm basically just continues crossing through those regions. Monday afternoon gets up into the northeast with some rainfall. Uh, and again, that second storm kind of combines with it. And by the middle of the week, we've got pretty good rain chances uh, for many folks in the Ohio River Valley, uh, the Appalachia chain, even down into portions of the Western Carolinas, maybe could see some rain out of that uh, as that system kind of works on through. And again, kind of pulls Helene up with it. Uh, and then eventually uh, kind of just does some crazy stuff off the coast of the Northeast. But again, the models disagree uh, pretty heavily here after uh, about five days. So don't want to talk too much about that in the long run, but know uh, that this storm system will be a pretty big uh, playmaker on the weather. And speaking of that, rainfall over the next seven days, again, look at this nice swath of rain through Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, Ohio, even up into the Northeast. Uh, you know, pretty good totals here, upwards of a couple inches of rain. Uh, definitely will help to kind of uh, bring some much needed relief to some areas that haven't gotten a lot of rain in quite some time. And then you'll also notice in the seven day range, uh, those rainfall uh, numbers picking up over portions of the Southeast. Final thing I'll talk about, and I know this is the longest video I've posted probably since the winter or maybe ever, honestly, at this point, I don't know. Uh, but uh, you'll notice temperature wise, again, it's going to stay hot for a while. We're still under this ridge. However, uh, Sunday afternoon, it's going to be much cooler uh, where we're seeing a lot of that rain there uh, back through Kansas and the panhandles of uh, Oklahoma and Texas. Again, that storm system going to cool things down a little bit. Uh, this weekend and even into early next week. Also going to stay a little bit chillier in the northeast uh, and potentially through the east again just due to that storm system. And then obviously whatever tropical system next week would cool things down with some rain. But other than that, you're noticing a lot of red on the map. So isolated spots could see cooler temperatures, but all things considered, a lot of red before maybe in the long run uh, again, we can finally get one of these fall fronts to work back in and maybe, you know, a week uh, to, or to, excuse me, a week to 10 days from now, uh, we could see more fall like temperatures kind of rolling on through. But uh, again, that's a ways away. All right. Well, that video was entirely too long. I know I keep saying that. Sorry. I apologize. Again, there are timestamps at the bottom, but if you made it this far, uh, then me telling you that doesn't really do you a whole lot of good. But uh, anyway, with that said, have a wonderful rest of your Saturday. Uh, stay safe out there and I'll see you all next time.